Great, thanks. Um, so yeah, thanks to all the organizers and all of you for a week of really interesting presentations. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna be talking about uh, robust uh, quantum control. Um, in particular, this new method that we we're calling universally robust quantum control. And this is based off this uh, recent uh, paper in, in PRL. Um, and so the kind of idea that you wanna have in your mind for the whole talk is kind of you know, summarized a little bit in this diagram here. So suppose you want to do some sort of state transformation or gate transformation. And uh, suppose using one of the methods that have been described like during the week, uh, you can go, you can design your field so that you get from your initial state to your second. Now suppose then I perturb your propagator somehow. So say you're Hamiltonian, I perturb it in some way. And now I live on one of these perturbed trajectories, one of these red lines. What can I do to enforce that these red lines, if I'm on one of these red lines, I don't really know which one I'm on, uh, that they still get, you know, within some error tolerance sorry, kind of close to it. So that's the kind of idea that you want to have. Okay, so I think I can kind of skip motivating quantum control at this point in the conference. Um, maybe just to kind of uh, set the scene for what I'm looking at. So I'm just looking at a closed time-dependent system, so pure states, open loop control, there's no feedback. Um, and so, you know, a combination of the sort of native always on or drift Hamiltonian terms and these time dependent you know, field terms, how do you tune them in such a way that you implement some sort of uh, state transformation in, in, okay, in our case, we're looking more at gates, but you can also states. Um, so that's, that's the kind of round that I'm going to be going to be talking. Okay, so that's quantum control. What about uh, robust quantum control? Um, so I guess there's a lot of things you could mean when you say robust quantum control. So mm -hmm. what I mean is kind of a Hamiltonian that looks like this. So you have some sort of blue Hamiltonian, this H0T, which is your kind of idealized description of your model. So that's what you think your system looks like. And that's how you design your time dependent controls. And then, you know, if you do that correctly, you follow some sort of idealized evolution and you Hit your um, and you do this in this time. Um, and what you have then is you have some sort of perturbation. So for the moment, this is some sort of weak static perturbation. And then this gives you some alternative trajectory. So you're on one of these red lines, and you might not necessarily get here. So that's that's what I mean by robust. Robust to this kind of. And in this kind of setting, there's two kind of approximations that you could make. One typical one is that this error is small, so lambda is some small number. So your gate fidelity is approximately perfect up to some second order correction in. So there's some sort of small correction, but roughly you're, you're getting it. So, you, so these red lines are close to where the blue lines are. So you're close. And the second type of approximation that you can make is you know what the perturbation is. So you know what this operator V is. So you can write down this fidelity susceptibility. So this is you know, the second derivative of, of the fidelity with respect to lambda. And you can write down an expression for what this is. So this depends on you know the total operation time scale. The longer you're doing it for, where you have an error, the worse it's going to be. And it also depends on this v zero bar, and this is basically uh, v time average. So that's where there's the bar uh, evolved in the interaction picture with respect. To so that's why this. So it depends on this the the norm of this. Okay, and so there's lots of different ways people have looked at this. I'm probably missing some. Uh, these are some different papers where they want to sort of be robust to this kind of error. So you want to, uh, you want to have a small error susceptibility, or fidelity susceptibility, sorry. Uh, so that then when you plot the fidelity against the error, you get some sort of flat line, the second derivative is close to it. So this is one example. This is another example. This blue line is like an optimized case where you get this sort of flat line you build this. Okay, so that's what people have looked at in the past. What do I want to look at? Uh, so basically, I want to kill this second approximation. So I want to say, I have some weak error, but I don't know what it is. So I don't know what it is. So that's the thing you want to look at. Right. So, so this is what we're calling universally robust control. So you have some weak static error, and you don't even know what the error is. You just know that it's small. And so this is the kind of recipe that we came up for how you do this. So the first step is you move to some sort of double Hilbert space. So people talk about this during the week. So basically, the operators I represent by some uh, kind of curly cat. They're kind of become vectors. 
And then we define the super operator M0. So this is a linear super operator, which maps this uh, perturbation operator V to our uh, V0 bar. So remember, we're yeah. in V0 bar because this comes up in our fidelity susceptibility. And then you notice that, okay, if, if, I, if this linear super operator was small in the norm, uh, if I make this small, the fidelity susceptibility is going to be small regardless of the V. So regardless of your choice of V, uh, you're still going to be robust. You're still going to kill this second. So the recipe then is is to kill this um, M zero term. So I don't actually write this out here, but you can write you know an explicit form. Of it. Um, so this becomes kind of like a numerical optimization problem. Then, like you have some sort of cost function, like this, and you want to make it okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, so I'm going to kind of compare three cases, and in the plots that you'll see. There'll be these three colors, so they'll be kind of gray and blue and orange. So these are the kind of colors to remember. And the first case is the first is the case that we would have seen during the week, which the only thing you're optimizing is just the infidelity. Do I hit the target state, or in this case the target gate? Um, and that's the only thing you're interested in. So you try and minimize this infidelity. So that will be in gray. In blue, we'll have what was done in some of the papers I mentioned, where they minimize the infidelity and they also minimize this susceptibility with respect to some sort of known error B, so some particular error. And then the orange, what we're doing is you minimize, okay, this infinitely, you hit the target state or gate, and you also minimize this new kind of cost function such that you should be robust to arbitrary. And just to note, like you, you're still simulating the same thing. You're still simulating that idealized dynamics, the same thing as before. You're just kind of computing uh, extra things from that. So you don't have to simulate anything. Okay, so let's start with kind of a simple example. So these are the three cases. Um, and we have just a single qubit uh, where you have one time-dependent control parameter. And the first thing that you notice is when you try and minimize all these things, so these are some sort of combined cost functions, you try and minimize them. There's something kind of like a quantum speed limit. So I guess the first one is kind of like a quantum speed limit, meaning that in this kind of units of time, you have to go above one, essentially, before you can really get infidelity zero. Um, so there's kind of a minimal time scale to do this. But then if you add some robustness, I want to be robust to uh, sigma z errors, then this time scale moves up to two. And then if I want to be robust to any errors, it moves up to about two and a half. So there's this kind of hierarchy of time scale. So we'll come back to this later, but just to note for the moment, there's, there's this kind of change in time. Um, so, okay, great. We can minimize these. And then we want to check, okay, did this work? So we go back. And we simulate, okay, what if I did have all these different Vs? I actually simulate the error dynamics and I check, did this magically make them more robust? So that's what's shown here. So in the first case, um, the V is, is sigma Z and the, the blue and the orange are understandably pretty flat in the case where we're just optimizing for the um, perfect fidelity. So in a, a lambda is zero, where the error is zero, that okay, only works there, but otherwise it, it's a case quite good. Um, so great, that's what they kind of were designed to do. But over in this panel C, if you average over you know, all sorts of different random Vs, you get that, okay, the blue one performs better than the gray one because okay, some of those random Vs maybe are close to sigma Z, but the orange one still remains quite flat. So this is kind of what we want. So if you have some sort of random Vs, you don't know which V you have, you still get a good fidelity even if you have a small amount of and so uh, these are just the you know, different control pulses that you get here. They're piecewise constant. That's not actually you know important. We tried other things. It doesn't really matter about how you parameterize it in time. Um, but in this case, okay, this is okay. Um, so th that works for the single qubit case, and that's great. Um, the next kind of question is okay, why does this work? Or like how does this? Work? Um, and basically what we're demanding is that, okay, if you map this uh, super operator on any V, you get something small, you essentially get zero. And what this amounts to is uh, this V in the interaction picture time average give you something proportional to the And uh, this re result is the exact same thing you get if you did a R average over the U's. So over the kind of, sorry, I should say this U zero is just the time evolution operator with respect to H zero, ideal dynamics. Um, but this, this proportional to identity result is exactly what you get from the R average, so the uniform distribution of views. Um, and it turns out that, okay, uh, a set of views which mimic the higher distribution in this sense is called a wonder. 
So the, the way that it works is basically it's approximating this sort of one design. And this kind of gives a little bit of an intuition about these speed limits as well, that like in some way you take a sort of a more elaborate windy path to like average out these errors. And this in a sort of a hand wavy way, like implies a sort of a longer. Okay, so that's the kind of intuition of what's happening. Um, the next kind of unanswered question is, okay, I did it for a single qubit. What happens if you have a larger system? How does this scale? Um, so the problem is the amount of operators you could have, you know, what Vs you could have, uh, you know, scales is like, you know, the dimension squared, which isn't great. So this super operator is going to be very, very large. Um, so what you could do, what we looked at was, suppose you, you don't know exactly what V is, but you know some property. Maybe you know that it has to be single body. Maybe you know for some physical reasons there can't be a certain transition, so you could discard some B. And what you can do is you can make the set of all the different Bs, partition them up into different kind of groupings, whatever way you want to do it, and project out the ones that you're not interested in. So you're basically projecting into the block of this linear super operator that you're interested in. And in that way, it's a, it's a smaller matrix. And so the norm of it is easier to, to, to minimize. So you're minimizing less. So the idea is that. It's some sort of interpolation between I know exactly what B is, and I know you know nothing about what B is, and and this is somewhere kind of okay. So um, oh. yeah, okay. Uh, so these are some examples uh, for two qubits and uh, okay two qubit gates and four qubit kind of fake control, and um, where these S X S Y and S Z are some you know uh, total uh, spin operators. Or collective spin operators. Um, and in the first panel, like before, okay, V is this SX. And so everything is robust apart from the gray line as before. Everybody is quite flat. You average over just the one body operators. This blue line is no longer robust because this was quite specific to just SX. And then if you move to average over just any possible V, only the orange one survives. The one that's kind of robust to everything. This green one was only robust to single body operators. This uh, isn't as flat anymore. OK, also to mention this, so this example is four qubits. This is for a state transfer. You can also do this for a state transfer. Um, and here, OK, the, the slightly different in that the, the green line is robust to single body operators. And the orange line now is actually just robust only to two body operators. So here, when the error is SX, the orange line is actually quite bad again. And then uh, this happens again here, but then they swap this average over two body operators in this panel C, or yeah. Um, and so this, this is better than the green one. Okay, so just to sum up then, to thank everyone who's working on this. So Pavel Paji, who's in Strathcali University in Glasgow, Gabriele Jacquera, Queens in Belfast, and Steve Campbell, who you heard from over the week, uh, also in UCD with me. All different funding agencies to pay us. Um, and so just to summarize, what was the method all about? So this is uh, some new uh, cost function, essentially, to ensure that you're robust to any weak static error. And um, this allows you to kind of interpolate between some partial knowledge, knowing what this error is. And there's this nice connection between one designs. Um, going forward, there's some kind of still open questions something like a, the speed limit for this robustness. How, how does that exactly fit in? Can you calculate this in general? Um, also, if you have different kind of constraints on your control, so say if you're sort of bandwidth limited and your sort of control pulses or different things, how does this affect how small you can make zero operators? Or if you have certain constraints, how does that play a role in robustness? Can you minimize to higher order? So we minimize this to second order in the error, but maybe higher order T designs are related to higher order errors. So you could kill higher errors and be even more robust. There's ideas about robust sensing. So since you can be kind of selective in how robust you are, you could be you know, very robust to everything by some particular direction. And then that direction, you could tune it the other way. You could maximize. So if I didn't say this, this uh, susceptibility term in, this, in the case of states this is exactly the quantum fission. So in that sense, you could make most of the terms robust, and then the other one quite large, and then you have this sensing um, idea. Okay, so again, you can find all the details in this paper here as a QR code, and thanks very much for your time. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you very much for this nice talk. Um, I have two questions, which are actually related to the bullet points you put there. The first one, it reminds remind me a lot of dynamical decoupling, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Especially if you go into this frame. So have you tried what actually the control sequences look like and what they do? I wouldn't be surprised if they actually implement the decoupling sequence in some way. And my second question is, if you think of higher orders, there are higher order decoupling sequences, right? Uh, to kill higher order terms of the Marcus expansion. Have you checked if you can inform the control design you have by these higher order decoupling sequence? And if so, because it is related to higher 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 T designs, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Oops, sorry. Um, so yeah, on the dynamical decoupling, I think it, it is quite related. I think the idea is that this is I hope kind of more modular in the sense that like you can bake in, like you don't know, you don't have to know anything specific about how your fields are parameterized in time or what's the structure of the Hamiltonian um, or even, you know, this kind of partial knowledge that you, like everything is just baked into just this cost function. And then you sort of approximate that whatever way and you don't have to figure out a complicated sequence. It's just like a minimization problem. So that, that was the kind of idea, but no, you're right. Like it is quite related. Um, my second question is related to the trade-off between the length of the pulse and robustness, namely the speed limit. So it's interesting to see that it's kind of a Pareto problem, right? On one hand, you have high fidelity, but at the same time, you also want to minimize the errors. Uh, it's interesting to see that the price you pay is a longer time. So my question is, have you at least numerically checked if you take a spin chain and you want to have robustness there, how the speed limit scales with the size of the chain? compared to without robustness. Right, so, okay, we, we haven't checked how this these time scales would change with uh, system size, but we did check, you know, you, you could argue that, you know, why not live here, run at a shorter time, this susceptibility will be smaller because it goes as t squared, and don't do the complicated evolution. And it turns out for the examples that we checked, I don't think this is probably true in generality, but like for the examples that we checked, you're better off waiting, you know, doing a longer time, doing a more complicated evolution. But I guess that really depends on how controllable your system is and the time scales. And, you know, if you have, you know, something like Markovian noise as well, like that you sort of can't counteract, and then maybe there's a sort of a Goldilocks zone. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know. But I, I guess there is some sort of sweet spot that you have a sort of a partially uniform evolution, which somewhat cancels things out, but you don't hang around for too long because it, the longer you're there, the worse it is. So I, if I was to guess, I guess there's some sort of intermediate time scale, but I don't know exactly what that is. So I see two other questions. I'm not sure who was first, Cristiano. Um, so since I have the microphone, let me start. Um, do you have any intuition? Most um, physical qubits are not just qubits, but live in a larger Hilbert space. And when you're spanning the whole operator space to construct this uh, super operator M0, do you have to span the full physical space or just the logical space? Because this is where the errors happen. Right. So yeah, so we uh, uh, span it within the same space as the Hamiltonian that we're considering. But of course, you could enlarge that with the trade-off that this M0 operator. harder to minimize, but you, you, you could do that. You could, um, instead of looking at just, like you said, the logical space, looking at the full spectrum that might include uh, like, you know, leakage to some higher levels. But, but, but is this necessary or not? Do you have any intuition? Uh, I guess it would be necessary like if you have some sort of leakage outside of the space that you want to maybe kill this counteract what that B would be. But maybe by expanding the space, you include like quite a lot of terms, most of which are maybe not relevant. So yeah, this is something we're still kind of thinking about. Like it would it would be helpful if you knew uh, that you could expand the space and still rule out quite a lot of error terms on some sort of physical basis so that it doesn't grow too badly. So that would be the Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, universal uh, approach. Um, so instead of projecting out things, uh, you could probably also combine it with, so to say, a weight matrix uh, that uh, then, uh, so to say, scales uh, 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 according to the uh, the danger of the different errors. Yeah. 
uh, and combine it also with, uh, so to say, Lindblad or error learning, uh, and then really uh, uh, nicely fit it in in a hierarchy of errors, uh, which you then simply weight uh, with a different penalty. So I think that's a very general approach which you propose, which invites uh, uh, these types of uh, future development. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I think at the moment, I guess you could interpret that as like any possible V is as sort of an equal weighting. But yeah, you could maybe think about. Uh, Why is it learning? 